Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me again uh, as we continue to study Paul's letter to the Romans. We're in chapter 9, and today we're looking at chapter 9, verse 19 through to verse 29. Yesterday, if you were with us, you'll know that in the first part of chapter 9, Paul does two things. Number one, he defends his own position and his own attitude and commitment toward his own people, the people of Israel, and my kinsmen according to the flesh, as he calls them in uh, verse 3 of chapter 9. Then from verse 6 through to verse 18, he basically defends the fact that God has not forgotten his word, he's not broken his promise that God's word continues to remain true, and that um, even in the face of Jewish unbelief, God continues to remain the God who keeps his promises. And Paul does that by showing that God's purposes, even through the Old Testament, for people um, were always based not on works, but on grace, not on natural descent, but rather on promise. And he used the example of Isaac and of Jacob to make his point. And then we saw that God's dealings with Pharaoh underlined the fact that God is the God who has mercy and shows mercy. Now, remember, in chapter 9, 10 and 11, Paul is explaining how God's saving purposes for the world include or embrace his ancient people, Israel. He's been speaking about election. And whenever the subject of election comes up, people often want to say, well, it's unfair or more to the point If God is sovereign, verse 19, then why can God find fault with anybody who is an unbeliever? Who can resist him? Now, Paul speaks in Job-like terms when he says, Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will that which is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has not the potter the right um, over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use, one vessel for dishonorable? So, Paul is asserting the fact that we as creatures have no right to question God's purposes as the creator. He's wiser than us and he knows better than us. That's Paul's point. Now, we don't like to hear that as human beings, of course, because we we tend to think of ourselves sometimes as a bit wiser than God, although we won't admit it. But nevertheless, um, Paul is saying, look, God is the sovereign creator. He is the one who forms us and makes us. And in fairness to God, he has the right to do what he likes as creator. But Paul's point is not just God can do what he likes, so sucks to you, your opinions don't count or you don't matter. In verse 22, Paul actually is arguing a point. Have a look at it with me, will you? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience the vessels vessels of his wrath, prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of his mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. So here's Paul's point. What if God, in his sovereignty, puts up with people like Pharaoh, whom we saw, vessels of wrath? What if he puts up with them, even though those people are deserving for his wrath? What if God puts up with the vessels of wrath, And in his sovereign power is working in his world, including his plan with those who do not believe in him, so that he might work out his purposes for those whom he has chosen for mercy. And then Paul says, those whom he has chosen for mercy or prepared for glory, even us whom he has called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. So God's plan then is to be working out his salvation purposes for those whom he has chosen. And in the process of doing that, what does God have to do? In order to save his people, he has to, says Paul, put up with people like Pharaoh and like others who are rebellious against him and who resist his great purposes. Paul then turns to a number of Old Testament uh, passages to underline the fact that his teaching about God and his sovereign grace and his salvation is entirely in line with God's Old Testament purposes. He turns first to the book of Hosea. Hosea speaks about a day when God, who has shown um, his judgment against Israel, calling them not my people, not compassion, uh, which is the language that is used in the beginning of the book of Hosea. You, You can go and have a look at that book. Um, when you have a moment and see how God 
speaks about his people as being under his judgment, punished because of the blood of Jezreel. He'll no longer have, have compassion upon them so that they will no longer be his people. That's God's judgment against their sin. But then Hosea goes on to say that in a place where those who were called not my people, I will call my people. Those who are not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will, they, there they will be called sons of the living God. So in the midst of his judgments, in the midst of putting up with rebellious Israel, what is God's great purpose? He will put up with rebellious Israel and remain true to his covenant word because in the end, even through Israel's rebellion, the gospel will go out to the Gentiles. Now that's going to be a point that Paul makes throughout 9, 10 and 11. So when Israel went into exile because of their rebellion, what happened? Well, people like Daniel ended up in Babylon and through his witness, the gospel went to pagan nations. As the nations of the world saw God's dealings with Israel in the exile, the gospel was carried out among the pagan nations. So the hardening of Israel or God's judgment against Israel in the book of Hosea, talking about exile, led in the end to gospel salvation for the Gentiles. But of course, it's not as if God turned his back on Israel as a whole. Even when they were under his judgment in the exile, there was always a remnant. So, quoting Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27 of Romans 9, Paul says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel will be as the sand of the sea, that's the Abrahamic promise, at that point in the exile, only a remnant of them will be saved. So only a rump, a remnant, but a remnant nevertheless. Unlike the nation of Edom, unlike Assyria, unlike the other nations whom God in due course judged in their totality for their unbelief and their rebellion, even when he deals with Israel in his judgments, he always maintains a remnant. The book of Elijah speaks about a remnant, rather not the book of Elijah, but the story of Elijah in the book of Kings speaks about God reserving a remnant. Remember, Elijah thought that he was the only one left, but God reminded him that he had reserved for himself 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal. That's in 1 Kings 19. So God preserves a remnant for himself even when he judges Israel. And then again, Paul quotes from the book of Isaiah, this time from Isaiah chapter 1, where, so in the book of Isaiah chapter 1, God begins by the, uh, seeing the city, which was David's city, was a faithful city, now having turned its back upon him. And so the net result of that is the Assyrian invasion, and the whole city of Jerusalem is surrounded by troops, and in the midst of that, though they could have become like Sodom and Gomorrah, what does Isaiah say? If the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, that is a remnant, we would have been survivors. I think it's how the NIV puts it. We would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. So, verse 19 through to verse 29. What is Paul's point? Paul's point is, first of all, that God is the creator and as the sovereign ruler and judge of the world has the right to work out his plans and purposes, both for judgment and salvation. They are God's plans. God's plans for judgment over those who rebel against him, like Pharaoh and others. God's plan for salvation for those whom he chooses. God has the right to work out his plan and purpose. God is God. God is king. We are not God and we are not king. And we certainly do not have his wisdom. So God has the right to save whom he saves. That is a fact. God is always seeking to be merciful. God is always seeking to save and to rescue. Judgment is God's strange work. Salvation is what God delights in. But can you see from what Paul says here that if God is going to allow history to unfold and his plans and purposes to unfold, then his, his plan and his purpose to save his people by grace will inevitably involve him enduring with patience the vessels of his wrath. That's a very important phrase. We get it again in 2 Peter where Paul says, where Peter says that God is not slow concerning his promise, but is patient 
not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So whenever God deals with unbelief, whenever God deals with rebellion, even amongst his people, Israel, he's always working for his salvation plans, but his plans for salvation involve inevitably the need for him to be patient and to wait and to endure those who deserve his wrath. But with Israel, and that's the point that Paul's speaking about in Romans 9, even in the, in the height of God's judgment in the exile, was Israel cast off completely? Was Israel overthrown, overthrown completely? If it was, we could have said that God's word had failed. But not so. For even in the midst of the exile, Isaiah tells us, Hosea tells us, that God will save a remnant from amongst his people Israel, but at the same time as judgment falls upon Israel and a remnant is, uh, is saved, the gospel goes out to the nations. Hosea speaks about that. So that Hosea passage speaks about a day when among the nations, Israel's judgment will lead to people among the nations being called children of the living God. So Paul's going to go on now in the rest of chapter 9 and into 10 and 11 to argue how Jewish unbelief in his day leads to the gospel for the Gentiles. And of course, always keeping in mind that God isn't done with his own people yet. Hope you found that helpful. Uh, please go back and look at some of those Old Testament passages in their context, uh, the book of Hosea and those chapters of Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 10. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow.